The title of this lecture is Can a Bad Guy Tell a Good Story? Chaucer's Partner. The Partner's Tale is one of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Like The Thousand and One Nights and Boccaccio's Decameron, The Canterbury Tales is a frame tale narrative. It is comprised of 24 tales delivered by 29 characters. These pilgrims are a pretty random group of people. What do I mean by this? Well, one might say that many of them need to go on a religious pilgrimage because they are indeed so morally bankrupt. Some examples? Well, some of them are just going on the pilgrimage in order to dupe their fellow pilgrims out of their money or to find a new sexual partner, even though they are married. The partner speaks to this issue. For though me self be a full vicious man, I mora tala, yet I you tell a con. So in present day English, he's said, although I am myself a sinful man, I can tell you a moral tale. We'll assess whether the partner succeeds in telling a moral tale. First, let's get some context for what the Canterbury pilgrimage consisted of. The Canterbury tales center on a tale-telling contest that takes place on a road trip. At an inn outside of London called the Tabard Inn, a group of strangers, pilgrims, intending to travel to Canterbury Cathedral meet up. Their purpose? To visit the shrine dedicated to Thomas Becket, who was martyred there at the Canterbury Cathedral in the year 1170. Thomas Becket had been appointed Archbishop of Canterbury, that is the second most powerful position in all of England at the time, by his friend Henry II. The king thought that putting a personal friend in this position of power would mean that he, the king, had control over the church. And in this manuscript image, we see Henry II on the left and Thomas Becket identifiable by his crozier, that's like that staff thing that he's holding, and his bishop's mitre, the hat that he's wearing on his head. But uh, there was trouble in paradise for the drinking buddies at a certain juncture of their relationship this occurred when Thomas Beckett had a come to Jesus moment after getting the post and he actually began to take his job seriously. So after many years of locking horns with the king and Beckett living in exile in France, away from the English king, they quarreled once again. The king allegedly uttered some fateful words. Who will rid me of this meddlesome priest? On December 29th, 1170, four of Henry's knights did just that. They sliced off the top of Becket's head while he was praying in Canterbury Cathedral. And I should mention it's thought that Chaucer included 29 pilgrims on the Canterbury pilgrimage because Becket was martyred on the 29th of December. Here are a couple of images relevant to Beckett's martyrdom. This is a manuscript image where you can see the four assassins uh, striking Beckett, the bishop's mitre sailing off the top of his head in kind of a poetic image. This other image marks the spot where Beckett was martyred in the Canterbury Cathedral. You can see on the floor underneath that railing the letters H-O-M-S, and it is an inscription that describes um, what happened at the site. Up there on the wall, we have a cross that's made out of four swords. Uh, those represent the four knights who killed Beckett, and any time uh, medieval people can compare a saint or a martyr to Christ in some way, they go right ahead and lean in on that idea. So here what we find is... Um, the swords are fashioned in the shape of a cross um, to suggest, yeah, this guy died for the faith, just like Christ did. What we have here on this slide are a couple of images of relics, both big and small. So on the left, that is an ampule 
so like a tiny vessel that would have stored um, what was allegedly Beckett's blood. Above, this is a pretty exciting item. Uh, it's Beckett's bloodstained tunic, which is currently headed back to Canterbury to mark the 850th anniversary of his martyrdom. The Canterbury pilgrimage was extraordinarily popular throughout the Middle Ages. The people really loved Thomas Beckett uh, because he represented something of a um, homegrown hero, um, an average person who stood up to the king and got punished for it. So he talked truth to power and um, got martyred for the faith. Um, not exactly the case, because as I said, Beckett was himself in a position of great power, but nonetheless, he was um, embraced by the masses and the site of his martyrdom in the Canterbury Cathedral um, was very popular for hundreds of years. But why does Chaucer use the pilgrimage as a frame tale setting um, a couple hundred years after the uh, the martyrdom has taken place? So why does the pilgrimage, in particular the Canterbury pilgrimage, offer Chaucer a unique opportunity to tell his stories? Something that Chaucer loves to do throughout his literary herb is to contrast the sacred and the profane. So we will definitely get a strong dose of this in The Pardoner's Tale. The pilgrimage, which is a religious errand, allowed him to do this because many of the people who are along on the pilgrimage are openly vicious, if not deeply flawed. The pilgrimage offered Chaucer a premise for gathering people from all walks of life. So we are just reading one of the Canterbury Tales, but indeed in the um, collection of two dozen, you get very pious tales. Uh, a couple of those are told by clergymen and then some that are extremely body on par with the stories that we just finished from Boccaccio. Chaucer called this group of pilgrims uh, lovingly in the opening lines of the Canterbury tale, a group of sundry folk. So in modern day English, random people. In the general prologue where we meet the pilgrims who are on the Canterbury pilgrimage, they are identified in terms of their professions. So the person that we're reading about today is a partner. So he would have uh, been licensed by the church to sell pardons to people. So I'll talk a little bit more about his job when we get to his tale. Uh, there are all sorts of professions there along on this Canterbury pilgrimage. Chaucer was working with the medieval idea of the three estates, those who pray, so that's the figure all the way on the left there, that's a, a medieval monk. In the middle, those who fight, so that's members of the, aristoc um, the aristocratic class, uh, so women wouldn't have fought, obviously, but for men, in order to be uh, a knight, you would have had to be of aristocratic blood, and those who labor, so... Uh, on the far right there, we have a, a peasant who works the land. There he is with his um, with a shovel. Chaucer also includes members of the rising middle class. Um, so there's a doctor, a lawyer, lots of different craftspeople. So uh, scholars think that he maybe in assembling this random group of people was meaning to show that like the old class system of the three estates was breaking down um, and we have something of a, a rising middle class and a professional class. Estate satire. This is what the Canterbury Tales is often classified as. Uh, he, in each of his tales, uh, gets a little dig in of some kind about these various professions. If you think that that sounds a little bit dull, the modern day equivalent would be the workplace drama. So if you think about the show The Office, if you're familiar with that, um, each of those characters is a certain type of person that you'd encounter in a, a professional workplace. Here's how this storytelling will work. The 29 pilgrims will each tell two tales on the way to Canterbury and two on the way back. 
but there are only 24 tales in the collection, which means that technically this major work of English literature is unfinished. In thinking about the Canterbury Tales and why there's only 24 of them when there were supposed to be 116, why did Chaucer not finish this great work of literature? Uh, we might ask more general questions like why is Chaucer so highly regarded as an author and why does the Canterbury Tales occupy such an important place in the English literary tradition? Chaucer and Middle English literature. So Chaucer wrote in Middle English, not Old English. You'll get to hear some of it uh, pretty soon. So Chaucer is known for innovating English literature, but if we look at the Canterbury Tales, many of them are borrowed from pre-existing stories in other languages. He translated them into English, and granted, he greatly adapted them and also uh, used very uh, innovative and literary language and borrowed a lot of vocabulary from, um, from French, and so he really uh, gave English literature at the time a shot in the arm. So yes, there were texts written in English at this point, uh, but English letters was um, just coming out of kind of a star sorry state. Latin had been the prestige language in Western Europe until uh, the 14th century. Additionally, in English, there was another linguistic obstacle to overcome, and that was the fact that French was the literary language in England after the Norman Conquest of 1066, when uh, England was effectively, for something like 300 years, ruled by French kings. This image here is the Chaucer Pilgrim, uh, and it's often taken as an image of what Chaucer actually looked like in the Ellesmere manuscript of the Canterbury Tales. Um, it is thought to be the, the best manuscript, both for its um, closeness to Chaucer's intentions, because he didn't actually write it with his own hands, um, a scribe did that, um, and it is a manuscript that dates rather close to his lifetime. So he died in the year 1400. There are no manuscripts that exist for any of his works that were made during his lifetime. To give you a sense of what the English language sounded like before and after the Norman Conquest, I have here the Lord's Prayer in Old English and Middle English. So the Norman Conquest took place in 1066. The Old English version reflects what the language looked like before that, and then the version on the right is in Middle English, and so it should show a little bit more of a French influence on the language. Here's the Old English ver version. Father ure, thuthe erth on heofenum, si thin nama ya helgod, tobacuma thin riche, ya worthe thin willa, on Erathon, Swaswa, on Heafanum. Urne ye die huam lichan, laf sile us to die, and for yifas ura yiltas, Swaswa ye for yifas uram yiltendum, and ne ye lad thu us on kosnunga, ak alis us of ephala soth liche. So you might recognize the word evil in the last line there, and then the soth liche is something like amen. It's like literally, like truthfully. Here goes in Middle English. Ure fader that art in heavenus, hallowed be thy nama, the kingdom comto, be the will don, in ertha as in heavena. Yife to os this die or bread over other substance and forgive us forgive to us or a debtors as we forgive to or debtors and let us not into temptation but deliver us from evil After the Norman Conquest, English, which was the language of the average person, 
was third in the pecking order as a literary language after French and Latin. An overwhelming majority of people at the time couldn't read, so in a practical sense, this didn't really matter. The Hundred Years' War, which actually lasted 116 years uh, between England and France, um, like a lot of unresolved issues from the Norman Conquest and then all of the other like little mini fights that happened in the uh, 300 years between the Conquest and the Hundred Years' War come to a head. Um, and this war, I should mention, yes, it lasted 116 years, but it was fought in three major stages. So probably the actual fighting added up to about 40 years, but still, that is a long time. Uh, so th this war stoked English nationalism, and to that end, the crown perhaps helped promote English literature. So, for example, uh, English kings in the 14th century went so far as to allege when they were addressing Parliament that France, their familiar enemy, was keen to conquer England in order to wipe the English language from the face of the earth. So Chaucer and a group of authors who were working during his time, so this is the late 14th century, put English on the map as a literary language. So their uh, writing careers represented the first concerted out, um, output of English vernacular literature since before the Norman Conquest of 1066. In doing so, the culture was collectively rethinking what subjects could be written in English. So for example, it's pretty surprising to me that in 1362, the Pleading in English Act was passed. It mandated that English had to be used in legal proceedings. Um, they would have been conducted in French, but how would a native English person know what was going on? Recall in my lecture on Boccaccio, I said that the vernacular was gaining a foothold um, throughout Europe in the 14th century. Uh, same thing in England. And with this rise of the vernacular, um, granted, there's going to be different reasons for it in different European countries. In England, it probably had something to do with the Hundred Years' War, or should I say a big something. Uh, there's going to be a lot of cultural conversations about uh, what... Uh, types of texts the vernacular language is appropriate for, given that they've been uh, behind a paywall of Latin or um, French in the case of, of England. So, for example, a man named John Wycliffe was an English priest who proposed a series of church reforms. Uh, among them was translating scripture into the vernacular, and he had several other proposed reforms that were in this vein. So um, use of the vernacular in religi religious ritual was another one. He and his followers, who were known as the Lollards, are branded heretics, and uh, they would have been subject to the death penalty. So um, not surprisingly, uh, this law called like on the burning of heretics was passed in the year 1401 in response to the Lollard heresy. In 1401, excuse me, in 1409, owning a vernacular scripture would become a crime. To subsequent generations, Wycliffe would be known as the morning star of the Reformation, but not so in his own time. In the year 1428, on the orders of the Pope, John Wycliffe's body was dug up, burned, and dumped into the River Swift. So if you look carefully here, you can see... There's his skeleton, all that's left of him, he's been dead now for something like 50 years, uh, is being taken out of its coffin. There we have his skull in the fire. And then over here, the ashes are getting dumped into a river. So I know uh, you guys probably have a question, as I uh, would, but... Uh, why is scripture not in the English vernacular yet? So it's thought that the English language, which was the spoken uh, tongue of the unwashed masses, was not a fit medium for God's word. So that's reason number one. Another reason that's a little bit more insidious is that average people are not smart enough to make sense of scripture. They need the clergy to interpret it for them. 
so here we have an image, um, the opening of John's Gospel from an English translation made by the Lollards. Uh, it's not known exactly who uh, did this translation. For a long time, it was attributed to John Wycliffe himself, but um, the chronology just doesn't add up um, based on when he when he died in 1384. Um, as you can see next to that enormous initial I, it says like in, and then um, that's a letter that stands for TH. It says in, and then here we have this, this strange looking letter. So that's the, and then a word that looks something like B I G Y with the line over, it would mean a letter is missing. So a second N, there's another N. There's a, a Y with a, a dot on it, which means, okay, it's an abbreviation, which means there's an I there, N, and G. So in the beginning, you probably could see that without my even telling you. This perceived need for clerical mediation because scripture was behind a Latin paywall was exploited by corrupt clergymen. So the practice that they engaged in what's called glossing, uh, gloss means to interpret or to annotate. If you think a glossary in a book um, gives you a drill down of the important terms and uh, explains them. But the clergy were satirized by Chaucer and other writers as interpreting scripture in Latin in terms that favored the church establishment for themselves. So given that the lay people wouldn't have known what it said, um, and to this conversation, I should add that books are so expensive at the time because they're made by hand. So who can afford them? Uh, lay people don't have access to scripture. So um, it's not uh, too far of a reach to think, yeah, unscrupulous people might lie about what is being said in the pages of scripture. Corrupt clergymen are Chaucer's favorite target of satire. They are perhaps the most morally dubious of the pilgrims. There are six clergymen along on the pilgrimage out of um, 29 pilgrims. And yeah, um, they're a group of real winners. So, for example, the friar uh, is a notorious mooch. He begs for offerings from the lay people, uh, but he himself is, is getting pretty fat and happy from offerings, which really should just barely sustain him. He speaks that he's, oh, I'm subscribing to uh, Christ's model of uh, the way that he and his apostles lived off of people's generosity. But uh, yeah, the friar actually is living a pretty comfortable life um, from the offerings he begs for. The parish priest is the only one who's really on the level on this pilgrimage out of the, the clergy people. Um, according to him, as he puts it so eloquently, uh, when the shepherd is weak, the wolf shits wool. What we have here is uh, an image of a bishop dressed as a, a fox. So uh, yet another animal oriented image to explain uh, that you need a, a good, scrupulous, honest church leader to lead a flock of people. Uh, so I'm thinking that this here wolf, um, yeah, he's maybe more interested in, um, or excuse me, the fox. I, I think he might be more interested in eating the lay people instead of uh, leading them. So now we come to the partner who told the tale that we read for today. The partner might very well win the prize for the most corrupt clergyman on the Canterbury pilgrimage. He is indeed a secular clergyman, which means that he applies church authority in the real world. So he sells papal pardons and indulgences. So these are something like get out of purgatory free cards if you um, gave a donation to the church or uh, alternatively indulgences could be earned by engaging in spiritual activities. He also sells relics and as we learn uh, he brags very vociferously that yeah these are bogus it's just pig's bones but I sell them to these dumb pilgrims and make a nice buck. Uh, what we have here is an image of the partner that was included with the Ellesmere manuscript. Um, on a previous slide, there was a picture of the Chaucer pilgrim. Throughout the Canterbury Tales, 
Chaucer parodies all preaching practices, no matter who engages in them, meant to bilk the lay people of their money uh, or otherwise dupe them. So he, in doing so, brings up the issue of glossing and how, uh, yeah, clergy people like to use a little bit of Latin to confuse the lay people enough and make them feel like they are really, really, really smart wizards for knowing this Latin. So hence the partner's favorite theme for his sermons Radix malorum est cupiditas, meaning uh, money is the root of all evil. He says that he's going to do these lay people a favor. He is going to liberate them of their money. Additionally, in this prologue, he preaches about the virtues of the bogus relics that he sells to the unsuspecting lay people. It's hard to say which of the partner's vicious activities is the absolute worst, but here's here's yet another one. He also is licensed to hear confessions and absolve lay people of their sins. So, in fact, um, by virtue of, of having that job, he would be allowed to preach from the pulpit on occasion. And so he uses the pulpit to accuse people uh, of the sins that they've committed to quit, meaning like to requite or repay anyone who's crossed him. So he knows about people's sins because they've confessed them to him. Uh, so in case you're wondering, yes, an ethical confessor was bound uh, by the seal of confession, but the partner uh, apparently missed that memo. And what we have here is just a standard picture of a, um, a medieval clergyman hearing a confession, those um, loopy scroll things festooning the image uh, would be like the bubbles coming out of cartoon characters' mouths. Uh, this is the medieval equivalent of those. I would be remiss if I didn't read to you a little bit in Middle English, so uh, read along in the present day English and see how many words you can pick off as I read in the bolded uh, type. For certes, many a predication comes off the tema of evil intention. Some for plaisance of folk and flatteria, to ben advanced be hypocrisia, and some for vain gloria, and some for hot. For when he dare, nun otherwise devats, Vanna wally stinga him with me tonga smerta in preaching so that he shall not esterta to ben defamed falsely if that he hath trespassed to me brethren or to me for though he tell not his proper nama men shall well canoa that it is the sama be seen as and be other circumstances Thus quitty folk that do not desplances. Thus spitta e ut me venom under hua. Of holiness to semen holy and true. Let's turn now to the partner's tale. Uh, that is obviously not a medieval image, but it nicely captures the plot of the story. The partner's tale has a long preamble about various sins. They are stopped in an alehouse now, so it perhaps stands to reason that the partner turns to talking about gluttony. He presents gluttony as the original sin committed in the Garden of Eden. Two of our three revelers, party boys as I call them in this lecture, do die because of their drinking, literally speaking. But it's not really gluttony that motivates them. It's really more greed. What we have here in this image, this comes from a larger piece composed by Hieronymus Bosch called The Seven Deadly Sins. So this is the sin of gulla or gluttony. You can see at the bottom, um, bottom center of the picture, there's some letters and that's what it spells. 
So the three revelers are motivated by their greed. And so not surprisingly, the partner gets in a dig about gambling, which would have been sacrilegious in part because of the atmosphere in which it takes place. So um, there's drinking, gluttonous drinking, there's swearing, which he also talks about. But the partner also draws on a storied association between gambling and casting lots. Um, so matter uh, means of divination that are discussed mostly in the Old Testament. Uh, but this is his grounds for critiquing gambling. In a sense, the gambler is trying to predict outcomes when the dice is rolled, which is really more God's domain. So that is why gambling um, would have been verboten, um, at least according to this partner. From my money, it's his discourse on swearing that is perhaps the most interesting. As was common at the time, he preaches against swearing that's blasphemous. So what he's imagining is more like profanities. So taking the Lord's name in vain rather than swears that um, speak of obscene acts um, or vulgar subject matters. It was imagined that these swears uh, took God's name in vain and in doing so were literal attacks on Christ. Um, so some contemporary swears that late 14th century English people would have been fond of um, is to swear on Christ's body. So to say something like Christ's bones um, or Christ's wounds, um, this gets um, transformed into the Shakespearean curse of zounds or zounds, uh, which if you've read some Shakespeare, you perhaps come across it and wondered what on earth it, it was. Um, so swearing on Christ's body, a common habit um, at this time and place. Um, the reason it is so terrible is that it was thought because swearing, um, like if you swear on the Bible or you swear an oath, like you actually are completing something, accomplishing something, you're giving your word, uh, you're let's say uh, getting married or you're about to give testimony in court. Um, well, swearing on Christ's body and saying, you know, on Christ's wounds, on Christ's bones, on Christ's blood um, was thought to replicate the pain that he endured in the passion and do literal violence to him. In his discourse about swearing, the partner refers to the holy blood of Hales. So if you were wondering what on earth is that, um, this would have been a very, very famous relic that had been acquired by a monastery, um, Hales Abbey, in the late 13th century. So about 100 years before uh, the partner is delivering his tale, as it were. Um, what we have here in this image is a stamp, so for like sealing letters with wax, from the 16th century. The figure in it is shown holding a vessel that is thought to resemble the holy reliquary in which the um, blood was stored. So this blood was uh, thought to be um, a drop of Christ's actual blood. So it was a very precious relic. Um, there would have been many, many, many such relics like this um, passed around during the Middle Ages. Uh, but it was very exciting for Hales Abbey to get um, to get a hold of this. It thus became a very popular site of pilgrimage. Uh, English relics like this got destroyed during Henry VIII's reign. Um, he was very keen on dismantling the monastic houses, which, you know, really, really reeked of um, Catholic worship, i.e. medieval worship, um, papism, as he might have said. Um, the partner probably drops this little mention of um, Hales Abbey and the Holy Blood there because he himself does traffic in relics. And while this one... Um, was thought to be legit, um, was there in a very, um, you know, fancy building and, uh, there was a lot of pomp and circumstance sound surrounding it. Um, he's just got, you know, a bunch of pig bones in a small jar and passes that off as the bones of saints. So our three party boys like to hang out in the alehouse where they, uh, drink excessively, gamble and swear so while they're hanging out one day they see a corpse getting carried to his grave um and 
they're told that this is somebody that they used to know. So they get very, very pissed off and decide to conquer death, uh, a perversion of Christ's salvific passion wherein he died in order to gain eternal life for for humans so um right off the bat we know that these um party boys are you know irreverent and they're on bad spiritual footing recall the black death how it has hit western europe um a few generations before chaucer is is writing so maybe about uh 40 something years before he composes the um canterbury tales it wipes out close to half the population. So, uh, although it is not explicitly said um, what he's what he's died of, it is strongly implied that it is the Black Death. Um, what we have here is an image of death reaching into um, somebody's you know, face and you know taking the life out of them in a very very grisly image. So who is this old man that the three party boys encounter? Uh, that figure on the previous slide looks something like an old man uh, who, in interpretations of this tale, has been said to represent many different figures. He could be an allegorical representation of death, whom our party boys, uh, in fact, uh, find but do not recognize as they're standing there talking to him, uh, they're like, can you show us where, where death is? Uh, that's all the use that you will have for, for us. The old man says that he has traveled all the way from India, which is where the Black Death uh, came from, along the Silk, Silk Road uh, trade route. Um, remember the story about the ships that pull into the harbor at um, in Sicily? So... Uh, they had been trading in the Far East. Um, it is thought that the Black Death infected fleas on rats that were transported on boats. Um, I think that this theory has been problematized um, in my recent reading, at least. That's what, um, what I learned. But however, um, then I don't know quite what to do with the rat cameo that I love so much in this story. Um, the youngest of the party boys, um, who's up to no good, he's going to do away with his two friends um, in order to take advantage of, of them, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, he says he needs to get some poison so he can kill some rats. So I'm like, oh, you know, he's talking about his friends. This is just an alibi. But the fact that he mentions uh, killing the rats suggested to me the traditional uh, description of, of how the Black Death came to be. So the description of the body's uh, disaggregation um, from the point of view of the old man, he says, Lo, who he vanish, flesh and blood and skin. This suggests the way that victims of the Black Death looked. So he's maybe uh, somebody who's inflicted with the Black Death and an allegorical embodiment of death. The old man uh, says to the three party boys, well, been nice talking. I got to be on my way. And they say to him, nay, all the trail be God. Thou shalt not so say to this other has a door anon. Thou part is not so leastly be St. John. Thou spark reet no of vilka traitor death. That is this country all our friend is slith. Have her me troth as thou art his espia. Tell her where he is, or thou shalt it abia. Be God and be the holy sacrament, for soothly thou art on of his ascent to slain, us younger folk, thou falsest faith. And here's the old man's response. He says, No, sirs, quod he, if that you'll be so left to find the death, turn up this crooked way, for in that grove he laughed him, be me fay, under a tray, and there he will abida. Not for your boast, he will him no thing heeder. Say ye that oak? Greet fair ye shall him finda. God save yo that bought again man kinda and yo amenda. 
Though said this old man, an average of the Sagria Torres ran till he come to that tray, and there they found a of florins, fina of gold, ecoina runda, well near an eight of bushels as him thought a. No longer than a after death they sought a. So why do they find gold instead of death? Uh, a familiar way of interpreting this scene is as a socio-economic fable about the Black Death. So those who survived it, in fact, gained prosperity because of job openings. The location of the money under the tree evokes the Garden of Eden, where humans uh, you know, thought they had found something juicy and delicious. Uh, i.e. the forbidden fruit, but in fact, they found death because they were so greedy and gluttonous. Um, the partner, you'll recall in his account of gluttony, has said that this is the sin that Adam committed that brought all of humanity down. So if the scene there under the tree um, evoked the Garden of Eden, it then becomes the setting for a perverse Eucharistic exchange. So the youngest party boy is sent out to bring back bread and wine. When he returns, his two friends uh, gang up and kill him, thinking, hey, why divide this money three ways? Why not just uh, two ways? So the wine, which the youngest party boy had poisoned, saying that he, he needed to uh, kill some rats, kills the other two rather than affords them eternal life as Christ's blood does. So here's a Eucharistic meal that um, brings death in, instead of eternal life. So our friend, the partner, to his credit, knows what he's talking about in that he tells a really crafted tale that repurposes familiar religious symbols to make an argument um, about uh, greed, among other things. A couple of lectures ago, I mentioned how the Black Death changed the aesthetics in the visual arts and in literature um, in the late 14th and 15th century. So um, one dominant motif was the dance of death. Another one was three living and three dead um, shown here in these images where there's um, three people and then there are three uh, ghost of Christmas future, dead skeleton people. Um, each of these is associated with a, a different tale. So sometimes it's the case that the living people go out on a hunting trip and run into the three dead people. Um, the way the tale goes down is um, various, uh, but it's been thought that these three living people who quickly, you know, uh, encounter their dead selves uh, speaks to this iconographic motif. So either for good or for ill, we receive the partner's final pitch to buy relics maybe a bit differently. So even though we know he's full of it, um, he told a good tale and uh, the tale itself is about bodily disaggregation and human mortality. So indeed, that old man who's fallen apart right before the three party boys, um, it seems like his body is um, already something of a relic um, for all of the uh, nasty skin and bones that he described uh, hanging on his body. Um, the host is normally pretty mild mannered. So once the partner gives his pitch, about the relics, um, he does not take it all that well. So this is the partner speaking. He says, Look a witch, a surete, is it to you alla that e am in your fellowship ifala, that may a soil yo both more and lassa, when that the sola shall throw the body passa, e reda that or hosta. Hair shall begin a. For he is most enveloped in sinner. Come forth, 
sir host and offer first or none and thou shalt kiss her the relicas ever it shon yea for a grotta on buckler anon the pairs so let's have a listen to the host reply he says nay nay quod he then a heavy christ's curse let be quod he it shall not be so fetch thou wouldest make a meg kiss a thin all the bridge and swear it were a relic of a saint though it were with the fundament the paint but be the cross which that saint eleanor found e would e had the colons in me hand instead of relicas or of sanctuaria let cut a hem off e will they help a hem carrier they shall be shredded in a hogus toward so to uh paraphrase this in present-day english the host rejects the partner's offer in pretty explicit terms he alleges that the partner would pass off his own skid mark stained pants as a relic that needed to be revered additionally the host says that he's gonna make a relic of his own when he cuts off the partner's balls and enshrines them in a pile of animal dung a hog's turd in particular so the host is wise to the partner's game and kind of gives it back to him he's heard the partner brag uh before his tail that he passes off um, relics that have no power that are just fake um as veritable um sacred relics um but his response also like represents another twist there at the end of the tale um chaucer's meta commentary on uh the sale of relics and the practice of adoring relics uh so in the host's like very very vulgar um very very profane response to the the partner um chaucer wants us to think um you know isn't he kind of right indeed aren't all relics even when they're real uh kind of gross so um chaucer was known for not having a lot of patience for orthodox worship um or at least as an author he saw uh opportunities where he could satirize religious devotion as well as other um cultural practices common in his day um including those uh, occupations engaged in um, by the pilgrims who are taking their trip to canterbury so that's it for this week um good luck with the reading and see you later